when you make a memorial, it's a very serious business. And what you've got to do is create a shape or a form, some sort of object that, that expresses an idea. It's the physical manifestation of an idea. And if someone's good, they can make a simple shape speak eloquently. I mean, the great examples are in the mall in Washington. The Lincoln Memorial is just a, a four-square box, but it, it conveys fortitude. Lincoln holding the country together for the four years of the Civil War. Washington Monument, an exclamation point, the gesture of a founder. Or the Jefferson Memorial, just this little emblem of clarity, the, the sphere representing the intellect of the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence. In each case, the artist or architect had an abstract idea, intellect, fortitude, founding, and found a shape that, that expressed it. And that's about as far as a monument can do. It can express a single idea or, or feeling cogently. A monument's not a Russian novel. You can't say a lot of things. You can say, we, we won, we lost, we grieve, we remember, we, we celebrate. The problem with 9-11 is that process of clearing your mind and finding a shape, finding a shape to represent what happened, is interfered with by the visual memory of the towers. And there's a lot of visual noise in the mind of, of all of us. The towers themselves before they were struck, the explosion of the planes, the, the pneumatic collapse of the towers, all these things fill our minds with graphic imagery. And the problem is virtually every design that's been proposed fails by comparison with how vivid those images are. It's been impossible to make a vivid image that could stand comparison. As a result, artists and sculptors have tried to make things that represent the towers. And this is a mistake, because what has happened in the end is a design that, that grieves for the missing buildings, not the people. American culture lacking any tradition of, of looking at art, which, which, which takes some training and comparison and mentoring. Because Americans lack that, the principal American frame of reference for judging whether a work of art was good or not was how well it captured reality, how crisp the outlines were, how meticulously texture, surfaces, and materials were rendered, rendered faithfully on the canvas. And this is something that American merchants and American culture was mercantile, cared about. They might not know about sensuous play of red and green, but what they, they did know was the quality of wool and cotton. They knew the weight, shape, the, the heft of things. So they would, they would judge a painting additively by, by the faithful rendition of the, the physical world. That's the empirical that's the, the empirical insight. These two insights that art must have a, must serve a purpose, a, a moral or didactic purpose, and that, that art which is most legible and lucid in, in representing the natural world, these two things have come together again and again in American art history. And you see them both in action in the Hudson River School, faithful depiction of the North American landscape in the 18, 1830s with a strong moral message. I don't think now that empirical, the empirical worldview is as important to artists as it was. Nonetheless, it's a persistent habit of, it's a persistent preoccupation of American artists and, and the public. Photorealism appeals to that. Photorealism, which was very much in vogue in the 1970s and 80s, it's, it's now passed from fashion. But I think, I think this is, part of the historic American experience of art, and it will return again in some form or other, whether or not we recognize it. Picture this. You've got a bright student who, in his junior year of high school, reads something by Dostoevsky, and it catches fire, and they love it. And they can't get Dostoevsky out of their mind. I was not that student, but I, I can imagine such a student. And he goes to the library and he reads those other, other books and is captivated by the intensity of expression in Dostoevsky. Problem is his calculus grade dropped. He got a B, pulled his average down a bit. He didn't get into Williams. 
As a result, I think there is a tendency at the hyper-competitive college to bring in students who very assiduously have made sure they've made no mistakes, tend not to be risk takers, rather very careful profit maximizers. And I find the absence of a certain questing, nervous restlessness a problem among my students. Also, they tend to be overbooked now, which they weren't 20 years ago. They tend to have slots for the different studying intervals and their, their copious a cappella groups and, and, uh, uh, and intramural sports, etc. So there is not much room for a student to discover something in a paper that's, that's uh, extraordinarily exciting that they throw themselves into it with abandon for a week. This will tend not to happen. And there's a kind of, there is a kind of unadventurous consistency in the product I get, which is my despair. I don't want to get into giving a whole lecture about them. I'm trying to think of a short version of getting at complicated, complicated things. Maybe something more about corporate style after World War. Okay, okay. Um, the Seagram Building is the pinnacle of the international style skyscraper. This is the modern architecture developed at the Bauhaus in Germany during the 1920s. An architecture that was absolutely socialist and collective in conception. And the great irony of that is brought to the new world and applied to the service of selling whiskey. And the extraordinary thing about what Mies van der Rohe did here was to take a recognized building type, the New York commercial skyscraper, and completely rethink it. Beginning in 1916, New York recognized that skyscrapers could not be allowed to build unchecked. Eventually, New York City streets would be rendered dark and dank canyons. So a series of sophisticated zoning restrictions were made, mandating that a skyscraper step back at predetermined heights, depending on the width of a street, giving that characteristic chisel look of the New York skyscraper. Now, for Mies van der Rohe, this was simply impossible. A sculpted, chiseled mass would read like sculpture. And what he wanted to stress was the abstract clarity of form. So what he did was to push the building back to the site, clearing open a volume, creating the necessary, the necessary light and air volume. Had he pushed the building to the street, as most New York commercial towers do, you would not have a building, you would have a wall. The whole thing done with the, the characteristic clarity of Mies van der Rohe, whose design process was one of, of uh, a kind of uh, a persistent alembic of clarity, redefining and, 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 and re-clarifying his thought process uh, to suppress any hint of willful or, or way, wayward play of personality. The result in the end, in the end is a building actually which has a great sense of personality, but a strong, powerful personality held in reticent check. It's one of the great objects of American architecture. Well, that was an appalling spectacle of Bollinger congratulating himself on his commitment to free speech when he didn't do anything to discipline the people who denied the Minutemen the right to free speech. And it was clearly, it was a very popular political gesture on his point, using a minijod simultaneously to, to present himself grinningly as a champion of free speech and then indirectly to administer a slap to the Bush administration. Yeah.